welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. My name is Kimberly Jackson and I'm the executive director of our think tank that was created by Congressman Bill Young as a way to make sure that we have connection with the community and that we convene conversations in depth, solution oriented on nonpartisan issues. I'm honored today to be here with Corporal Banner. And I'm also honored here to be with Tony Roach. And you're gonna to have to tell me your exact title so I don't get that wrong. Because today we wanna to talk about the intersection of policing and mental health. Um, our audience doesn't know this, but we were privileged to serve on panels with you um, at a recent forum where you all both just enlightened me about the challenges that you all face in the policing area and what you're doing. And I think that message is important and needs to resonate so that people understand what our officers, what our law enforcement is do are doing to make sure our community is better. So I'm gonna throw out these questions to both of you all and ask you to give a little bit about yourself first so our audience knows who we're talking to. My name is Tony Roach. I'm a captain with the Pasco Sheriff's Office, and I oversee our behavioral health intervention team. Our team is, um, it, it consists of detectives, sergeants, lieutenants, and myself, and we have collaborated with BayCare Behavioral Health. Our goal is to identify people who are disproportionately using um, emergency services due to instability from mental health and or substance use and connect those individuals to community-based resources for improved stability and improved quality of life. Wonderful, thank you. And sir, if you um, introduce yourself Corporal, as well. Corporal Brian Banner with the Pasco Sheriff's Office, working in the community engagement section. In, in a nutshell, I support the efforts of, uh, of the captain and the Sheriff's Office. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that's a good start. So I'm going to throw these out to both of you. And that is how has law enforcement approached community policing in recent years? And what effects do you see those changes having on the way the community interacts with law enforcement into the future? And of course, we've all had a trying year under COVID conditions and enlightenment over challenges of equity. And having spoken to you both over the past couple of weeks, I know that you all are making significant headway, but if you'd share your thoughts on that, on enforcement and community policing. From the community policing standpoint, I think that people have a, a very um, different idea of maybe what that looks like and how it looks from my lens is, as I mentioned, we work with our mental health and substance use population who are often viewed as this cast off to society and that their problems are theirs and it's um, something that, that they have control of and if they could just change then then they would be uh, quote unquote normal. And, um, and if, if anybody takes any time to do research on mental health and, and the, the, um, the, the effects that substance use has on the body in particular the brain, they would understand that this is not something that is within their control, within their scope of mastering and people just can't snap out of it. So from a community perspective or community policing perspective, we are, we're engaging that population. We treat everybody with dignity and respect that they deserve, they're human beings and they need help. We, um, in some audiences, I kind of refer to us as a, as a buddy system, but, but we're, we're a liaison. We have found that a lot of community-based organizations tend to move a little bit quicker when a law enforcement officer is advocating for somebody. And when we identify people who, who need um, connection to resources, that's what we do. We go out, we interview them, we find out what are their challenges, what are their strengths, and, and we work with both of those. We work with um, community-based providers we provide that connection. We ensure that the individual um, makes their appointments, can, can physically get there. Um, I know COVID has, has relaxed a lot of, of uh, medical processes that allow for telehealth, but in some cases, the subject still needs to go to an office, and which creates another set of barriers. How do they drive to their doctor's appointment? Um, when somebody has some significant mental health or substance use issues, how do they remember their appointment is on a Wednesday? You know, um, I live and die by my calendar on my phone. I couldn't imagine somebody having daily struggles to think about, oh, I have a doctor's appointment on Friday at 1030 
don't forget. And oh yeah, I have to take a bus for two and a half hours and three, three crossovers in order to get to that appointment. So we take those barriers away. Hey, I'll be at your house at 10 o'clock in the morning. Be ready, hop in the car. We'll drive to your appointment. I'll wait in the car. And when you're done with your appointment, I'll take you back to the house or we make alternative um, transportation arrangements. And so that's why I say, you know, we're kind of this buddy system, this liaison, because whatever barrier that person has, I've got a solution for it. Um, we're, we're not going to take no for an answer. Well, we, we've got a lot of problems in our community, but sometimes it just takes some out of the box thinking. And, and um, when people are, are continually frustrated or met with, with walls, it's easy to just throw up your hands and go, I give up. And, and so we're con constantly their cheerleader there and encouraging them and working towards um, successful resolution of their cases. And we've had quite a few successes of people who get connected to services, have improved quality of life. They've reconciled with their spouses. They've been able to be reunited with their children, with, with family members who had distanced themselves due to their their um, their their issues that they were struggling with. So we've seen a lot of positive um, outlooks for people with with our inner with our interaction, and then and then really from a a, um, a public perception where where our team is not looked at as. Um, you know, a cop that's banging on your door and trying to take you to jail. Our community is getting used to having the, the, the mental health guys showing up at their doorstep and, and they have a different outlook of the way that we are interacting with them and they're trusting us more. Our homeless population is like, oh, well, I'm not going to talk to you, but I'll talk to you because they know the work that we're doing and they, they appreciate the efforts and they don't see the gun and the badge as a barrier anymore. So I think that that goes a long way to show um, to show some trust in the community and, and the efforts that we're trying to make for a very vulnerable population. I'm so glad you mentioned all that because as you know, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about the conversations I've had with many community leaders. And one of them was Sheriff Gutierrez that we had a mental health program with, with another judge and another um, attorney from Hillsboro, where they really talked about the intersection that there are more people in the system that have mental health issues than they actually have for cr crimes. I think the statistics that was presented was 70% really mental health, 30% crimes. So now that you have this new task for your officers, and sir, I'd like you to jump in too, how is this impacting your training for officers now that they know that they have to be more community minded, noting mental health and the exasperation of COVID on top of that? And how are you training them to think differently about use of force in light of the changing makeup of how we're doing community policing? And either one of you, but sir, I'd love to hear your thoughts. This conversation is so robust. My heart's just kind of palpitating as, as, um, as, as I'm listening to both of you speak. Um, Wow, uh, perspective, a value that of Kimberly Jackson, Tony Roche, Brian Banner, you know, Sam, Jack, Sam Jenkins and, and everyone else that's um, listening and, and participating in life. And so, so um, referencing policing and, and the community and the intersect, you know, the intersect of policing and mental health. Um, I'm, I'm currently working in the community engagement section as, as, as I'm listening, I'm like, well, perhaps there should be the advent of a law enforcement um, engagement. So, so that would be the equivalent of or the counterpart to what I do, but on the civilian community side, because um, uh, the necessity of one naturally constitute its counterpart, just for better relations. Um, so understanding the intersect of, of, of policing and mental health, uh, you know, like one of my first questions, are, it, it would be like, so what's the difference, right, between me and, and uh, anyone else walking around on this planet? In terms of my role as a, as a deputy sheriff, or as, a, as, a, as a public servant, um, and those who I serve. Um, and and if, if we were doing anything here that's novel at the sheriff's office, it would be to, to address issues upstream, right? Um, look at the contributing factors. What contributes to, to crime? Well, it, it turns out it's mental health. Um, where do we get our police officers from? Well, it turns out they're from the community. <laughs> so, so, 
Um, does that mean med police officers have mental health issues? Stand by, <laughs> right? Um, what's the answer to that? Because, and you know, I say this jokingly, but in all seriousness, we're not pulling police officers out from, from someplace um, unknown, right? There, there are people just, I'm a person just like anybody else who I encounter. And, and the understanding of that, thorough understanding of that as it relates to training and use of force, well, how much force should I use? Just enough to get the job done. That, that's the, the, minimal, the minimal amount necessary. If I were that person, what would I want? How would I want to be treated? Um, if that person were, were, was, was one of my loved ones, how would I want that person treated? Um, if, if we were to examine anything, referencing even policies and, 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 and bills and all these, these, these laws that are enacted, they're, they're grounded in, in, in very basic principles, which is just to kind of um, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And, and, and uh, that I think, is, you know, I, I looked at one of the questions you're referencing regarding HB 7051 and maybe I'm a part time comedian, you know, and, and a full time deputy, but we, we have the Ten Commandments that people can't follow. And so whenever whenever I think about law, I'm like, well, wait a minute, we can't follow the Ten Commandments. Then I'm not sure we're going to adhere to to everything else that we've listed out here. But if I can if I can look at. Kimberly Jackson, Tony Roach, Chris Knock, or anybody else for that matter, and, and, and love that individual the way I do myself. Well, it seems like I'm going to check all the boxes with that. So I will not discount um, any effort. I will not discount any initiative regarding a, the addressing of those issues. But the bedrock, because it's, it, it's, it's, that's what it's, that's what it's, that's the, that's the, the, the bedrock on which um, those structures and those policies and those these entities are erected. It's it's the idea that hey, if I can view the other person as myself, well then this interaction goes a whole lot smoother and a whole lot easier. Um, and if if we're doing anything here that I'm so happy to be a part of, it, it's that, it's that the intersect of policing and mental health, um, the development of a law enforcement engagement. Um, section in the community or in the world or in, in Pasco where we, we're, we're here. And we're having those conversations. That's the only reason why this works. We're going out and we're having these conversations. We're addressing things upstream. Again, what are the factors that are contributing to the, the over 1,500 inmates that are incarcerated or in here in, in, in county jail, right? What contributes to that and how can we mitigate that? We're not going to address that by making more handcuffs or, or, or by an expansion, so to speak, right? Let's look at the issues, address those, and then minimize the potential for use of force, the potential for deadly force, right? Um, that's, 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 that's my approach. That's our approach. That's what we're doing. And, and, and you know, I'd like to see that um, elsewhere in the country. And, and law enforcement is such a thing that if someone sneezes in Pasco County, the entire country gets a cold because of an action of one deputy. And I'm not sure that's just specific to law enforcement, but, but we, we, we have a, pe people are inclined to look at that. And, and, and then so, you know, even look at the history of policing, um, what, how that started, the, the, the current climate or the current, current operational environment of policing, are, are, the, are the, 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 is the approach still um, efficacious? Do, do, do things still work the way that they did a hundred years ago, right? Um, we we can't police the way we used to police because the, the the population that we're policing um, is completely different than that which we used to police, and that's a dance that's going to go on forever. That's something that's never going to change. Um, not to get ahead of myself, but the 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 fact that again, you you will have a perfect policing or police system or or, or law enforcement agency when you have a perfect community. And you have a perfect community when you have a perfect law enforcement agency. That's never going to happen. That's never going to happen, right? Um, but the understanding that who Brian Banner is is a, is a direct reflection of who the community is. And who the community is is a, is a direct reflection of who Brian Banner is. Having that understanding in my head, you know, the realization that an us, uh, an us versus them theory, whoever us is and whoever them is, whoever you deem yourself to be, doesn't 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 bode or doesn't make for a very um bright future for any of us, right? That's that's going to work for ten minutes, and then we're going to have we're going to have an armed standoff, which, which 
which does not work and has not worked and will never work. I love the way that you said you're we're, what we're inclined to do because your approach now is changing that. You know, I always say this very lovingly. I'm from the Midwest and we had a program called Officer Friendly. And because of that, the story in my mind of how you engage with officers was predicated on all these officers coming to my middle school and high school and volunteering countless hours so that we understood their role in society. And so what you said just, you know, really makes me think of that in terms of the community is reflective of the people that are oh, in yes. it and how we engage with, uh, with each other is based on the strength collectively of the community. Who you all are recruiting from most likely are from people in the community. Yes. And so if we don't have, you know, stronger villages, stronger educational systems, yeah. stronger inter interactment and engagement, interfaith and how we um, work and play, if you will, then that becomes a challenge of how we know each other when something goes wrong. If you know that Johnny down the street has challenges with mental illness, then you don't have to worry about when Johnny's mom calls, you know what to expect and you know how to help. And I love the way you said that you take some of those basic things that we ignore about the system away. You know, I didn't make my appointment for my mental health because I don't have a car or I don't have funds or I can't pay restitution or I just forgot, or I'm just having a bad day, or I'm in a abusive relationship. There are so many things That's that might right. prevent someone to get from A to B. I'm interested to hear from both of you all as we wrap up, we mentioned legislation briefly, but how has the legislative process of HB 751 or HB 1, has that impacted how, you know, how you're in integrating that training or how you are changing your policing um, on a granular level? I would say that that legislation is, is great to have. Um, I, I do echo a lot of the same sentiments Brian has about some of our, our basic um, rules of engagement that people still don't seem to follow, but um, we, we have never um, authorized chokeholds unless it's a life or death situation. So that's something here for the Pasco Sheriff's Office that that was an easy no-brainer. Okay, no problem. We can we, we, we don't do that anyway. So sure, you know, add that to the list of things we can't do, no problem. Um, and, and, and as Brian mentioned, the amount of force that we use is just enough to get the job done. If it's, if it's tapping you on your shoulder and, and kind of, you know, like holding it and say, okay, let's go this way instead of that way, then that's what I got to do. Um, and, you know, but, but, but we're meeting it with the minimal amount necessary um, but then to remember, there's two people involved in this. This is the, there's the individual that doesn't want to cooperate, and there's the law enforcement officer. And and if you can have that mutual respect and 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 what the end game is for the interaction, will definitely impact on whether or not force is even necessary to begin with. So a lot of times, just cooperation and understanding from the person, the individual, and the law enforcement officer. I think sometimes. Um, you know, I, as a mom, it's like, well, when I tell you to do something, it's because I told you to do it. Like, I don't have to explain myself. Well, there, you can't always send that parallel of parenting over into, into the community. I, I'm asking you to do something because I'm a law enforcement officer. But, but I think that as an, a reasonable adult, if you explain why you're asking that individual to do that, you're more likely to get compliance. Um, and it probably will work with your kid too, but um, but sometimes we kind of get that in our head as I told you so. Um, so I think there's a lot of mutual respect that goes in with that. Um, as far as, as other things that we've done here at the sheriff's office, we um, I've, I, I am a mental health first aid instructor. It's a, it's a wonderful foundational course. It's eight hours. It's nationally, um, it's a national curriculum that a lot of agencies use. And we use it in when we bring on new law enforcement officers to the agency, we're teaching them to recognize signs and symptoms of mental health and crisis and how to de-escalate effectively without using force. Our, our mouth is our most powerful tool. And if we use it, we're gonna get a lot further than trying to use, um, use strength. Um, I also mentioned a couple of weeks ago, um, we, we also have, have jumped on board with Georgetown University and are working towards certifying all of our law enforcement officers to be able 
officers. And what that acronym stands for is Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement. I attended my training class last week. It was a fantastic course. Brian is set to go in, in October. And what, what our plan is, is to teach all of our law enforcement officers how to intervene when somebody's having a bad day. If Brian's having a bad day and he is not thinking clearly, he's had a disagreement at home or he's having trouble making um, his finances work and he's got a lot of stress, his irritability level is gonna be higher and he's gonna be um, more likely to, to interact with somebody in a less than professional way. And my job as his friend and his coworker is to recognize when Brian's having a bad day, do that shoulder tap and say, hey, um, I got this. Let me do this for you. Why don't you take a break? And what happens is Brian doesn't get in trouble. Brian doesn't lose his job, add to his financing trouble, and nobody gets hurt in the process because I have been empowered to learn how to intervene when I see something not going right. And on the flip side, when Brian receives his training, he's learning how to accept constructive criticism from a coworker and not get bent out of shape. Hey, you can't tell me what to do. Get off my back and leave me alone. So instead he'll go, oh, hold on. Tony's protecting me. She sees some red flags. I need to trust Tony and, and do what Tony tells me to do. Not because of my position in the agency, but because Tony's looking out for me and I appreciate that. And that's the premise of that active bystandership. And one of the, the big things that went horribly awry with, um, with George Floyd is we had officers standing by that knew it wasn't right, but didn't have the empowerment, the strength, the courage to intervene on a senior officer and say, hey, I don't think you should be doing that. This training program is going to empower all of our officers to, to do that and, and to help each other. And more importantly, to help the community. That's the end goal is to keep them safe, to keep us safe. And that's where that public trust is really gonna play out too when, when they know that, that everybody is working together for a common good. I couldn't have said it better, public trust. That is the whole shebang. You know, when you have engagement and people know that they can trust that even if they've done something wrong, that the process in place will help them, everyone stay um, safe, and there's trust in how that's delivered. I think that that's a big space. And I would say it's not just for your profession, it's for many professions profession. where there has to be trust in the system. I trust mm -hmm. that if I'm having a mental health challenge and I go to, I don't know, a, a healthcare provider, that the healthcare provider is not going to make a snap judgment, but actually put the steps in place. So I think that's an outstanding program and thank you for sharing. So I'm gonna ask you for final words, sir, on anything you wanna share regarding um, your department and changes and, and what you'd like, what nugget you'd like to leave for those of those people who are watching. Um, just to touch on the ABLE training or, or to answer your question in a nutshell, the responsibility of the community to do the same. Uh, uh, the laws are written in the Constitution, and, and our jobs as law enforcement officers to be professional, thoroughly understood. Um, but that's the language that we understand from our perspective. We started talking about lens and, and the varying perspective through which we all observe the world and interact with the world. And that's fair. If, if I want to improve the way I interact with, 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 with you guys on this call, then the first order of business is to, is to look at this from your perspective, right? And so if I can imagine what it's like from your perspective, and that dictates how I behave myself so that, so as to ensure that this, this conversation bodes well for yourself and for me. And, and the same thing is, th is true with law enforcement. I think oftentimes is we, we have our laws, but, 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 but then there are SOPs and GOs. And so it comes down to me as a law enforcement officer, knowing the rules of engagement and, and, and sometime known or unbeknownst to, to the individual I'm dealing with, they have absolutely no idea how to interact with me so as to, to, to increase the likelihood that that interaction bodes well for them. So, so they're checking boxes, which, which, which may be alerting me and, and, and they don't, they're, they're unaware of that. And there's also, you know, the, the sanctity of life, my own and, and, and that of the citizen that's, that's there as well. You know, I can't save a life if, if I'm dead, right? If I'm sworn to protect life, 
well, it would make sense to first order a business to protect my own so that way I can protect others, <laughs> right? So, so the analysis of that, how do I help that individual not to put me in a position, this conversation, this interaction, so, so, so I'm, I'm forced, the calculus of reasonableness must give embodiment to, or must give allowance to the fact that officers are forced, often forced to make split second decisions in situations which are tense, uncertain and rapidly evolving. Judge William Rehnquist, uh, Rehn versus Connor, right? Uh, um, so I have, we have that decision to make. How do I help that individual to know and, and to operate in such a manner that, 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 uh, increases the likelihood again that this goes well and decreases the likelihood that I have to pull my firearm and have a conversation that way because I don't want to do that you know and there are unintended consequences of me doing that George Floyd so Derek Chauvin did what he did and what's the unintended consequences <laughs> well I'm, a, I'm an officer in Pasco County I'm concerned because my agency vehicle is parked outside of the house and people have, have like lost their minds and so my kids are at stake now and so so, so now again Right, I may have to use force to protect my own life. Or I'm gonna have to take someone else's life in an effort to protect my own. Unintended consequences. Let's improve the narrative. Let's let's um, exercise wisdom and discernment, which every officer has to do in every interaction. Wisdom and discernment. What do I have in front of me? Let me triage it appropriately, and let's develop mediums of communication where. These conversations are had upstream. So when I do encounter the public, the public is aware of how to interact with Brian Banner so as to preserve his own life and their own because that's what's going on. And if we don't do that properly, well, by God, it goes from sugar to you know what very, very quickly. It gets ugly very, very quickly. And we're all, we're all in an armed standoff. So let's, let's, let's avoid that. Let's educate the public. Let's, let's, um, have these conversations. Let's um, let's break down the walls because, well, what's at stake? <laughs> All of us, the lives of every single person is at stake because it's a citizen that's going to save my life or take my life, right? It's a citizen that's going to do that. So let's have these courageous conversations was the words someone used in, in, in at the Life Summit. And let's be vulnerable and transparent. And I get it. There, there, is, a, there is a level of of um, I wouldn't say secrecy, but there's there's sensitive information and material things that we can't disclose to the public for the sake of. I get that, I get that, but I believe that we can move a lot closer to each other so as to 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 just secure our our collective well being, right? Because it's 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 bad, but the interesting thing is that I, I believe with every problem the solution is inherent. The solution to every single problem is inherent in the problem. There's only one thing you can do with darkness and that's turn the light on. That's it. There's only one thing. So the problem or the solution is right there in the darkness. It's the light, <laughs> you know? So given, given George Floyd lost his life and he contributed to that interaction as well, perhaps if he was aware and, and there, there are things that no matter what I do or the conversations we have, persons are gonna do what they're gonna do. It's gonna cost them their life. But when that happens, the community will say, you know what, yeah, we can't argue with that. That guy was informed and he chose to do what he did. And well, let's um, do what we have to do. Let's go home and go have a sandwich or something because that person made a decision, right? So there, we can't prevent everything, but I do believe that a good portion of, of, of um, a portion of it, the interaction, the, the negative interaction, the negative perception, we can do away with a lot of that. And, and, uh, and I'll, I'll continue to say this because, you know, if, if, if you like Pasco County or Pasco County is doing well, or if, or if um, ISPS is doing well, it's because Kimberly um, Jackson's there. That's why it's, it's well. That's why Pinellas is well. And that's why Pasco is well, because Chris Nako Sheriff, Tony Roche works here, and Brian Banner, and Stacey Jenkins, and everyone. And if you're doing terrible where you're at, it's your fault just the same. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. responsibility. It is your fault. Don't blame anybody else. If Pasco County is doing well, it's because I'm here. And that, I don't say that. Um, in pride. I say that because I've chosen to adopt that level of responsibility that says that. Every single person can do that wherever they're at. And they don't need anything to do that. They can do that today with exactly whatever they have. You don't have to wait four years to go to law school. You can do that today. Like mow your lawn and cut your grass and, 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 and hold the door for somebody behind you. Everyone can do that today. Sorry for getting so passionate, but... Uh... No, what you're saying is that good citizenship matters and that we yes, all have a role in yes. it. Yes. Yes. So I can't yes. thank you all enough for your vulnerability, as you said, your transparency and your candor. 
but most importantly, because you all obviously care about the community that you live and breathe in and want to make it better. So with that, I'll just say thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the we appreciate it and we value what you do and appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Hey, can I just, um, mm -hmm. and if you cut this and edit this, this is fine. Um, yeah. I, two things that you guys said that, that I really, um, I'm really excited about trying to move my work forward and my team. And, and Kimberly, you talked about um, um, like 70% of people who commit crimes have mental health. The rest of them um, kind of chose that path. And, and uh, one of the things that, that we're trying to work on here at the sheriff's office is to look at that 30%. And mm -hmm. Brian, when you mentioned looking upstream, why do people commit crimes? There, there's probably maybe statistically like 5% of people that are just deviant. But, at, but, but when I look at people in my community that have consistently been involved in law enforcement and crime, if you look at their history, they are full of adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. When you look at that 10 question um, survey that they did in the 80s, you, it, it, the, 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 the questionnaire is social determinants for health. If you have three or more ACEs scores, you, the percentage of you being healthy, having a long um, median longevity where the average age is the mid to late seventies, um, your, your risk of, of having um, your, your, your needs not being met, whether it's for shelter or safety and, and having a good job and all of these, um, these social determinants are all impacted and your risk is higher, the higher that ACE score is. But there's also a correlation between high ACE scores and criminal behavior. And, and I feel like there's a, that population that has been forced down a, a road that if they had somebody advocating for them, that they could jump that path and get on another path. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a project that, that my team is is wanting to move forward with where we look at those people that we've identified like, Hey, you have been in and out of the system for a variety of things, whether it's battery on a, a friend, um, a, a stranger, a robbery, a burglary, uh, drug possession. I mean, people just don't arbitrarily choose to use a drug that could potentially kill them the first time that they use it. There is something going on in that person's life that is not manageable anymore. And, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like if, if as a community, we can envelop those, that population with help, we could, we could bring some of them back from that path. And then I don't think, you know, we're realistically looking at a hundred percent success rate, but if you save one person, if you save two people, I, in my opinion, you know, when we look at clearance rates, when you can clear 20% of your burglaries, we feel like we're doing good. But you, if, you, if you were able to save 10% of that population, that's a human being, that's a person, that's a sister, it's a brother, it's a mother, it's a, it's a grandma, it's a daughter, you know, there, it, it's somebody who's important to another person. And I think that kind of goes back to both of you guys of, of everybody has value. Nobody has less value because of the role they are currently playing in our community because roles change day to day. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian can just be Brian. He's not going to be Corporal Banner, uh, you know, if, if, if he makes a bad decision and he's unemployed, uh, you know, all of us, all of us could have a bad day that could change our course. And if we, if we all look at each other as the human being and as an intercept point where we can positively impact somebody, then that's how you grow your community. That's how we all start to work together. And it goes and it degrades that, that concept that Brian mentioned of the us versus them, because it's a we. Mm -hmm. I agree with you about just the concept of what you said in general. Once you identify what makes someone unstable, again, you cannot save every person, but you can certainly strengthen and show someone what stability looks like. And then when individuals are stable, then they're less likely to engage in challenges that decrease that stability. And that's just human nature. And so I couldn't agree with you more about um, us doing a better job of wrapping around those that we can share what stability looks like. 
Um, and of course, that's dependent on circumstances of the community mm -hmm. and where we allocate our resources. I'm very passionate yes. about um, advocating for stronger communities um, because I feel like I am a, a, the pure benefit of one um, of where I grew up in a very stable environment uh, where I was, where the, all, everyone in the, in the community cared, the firefighters cared, the officers cared, my nosy neighbors who I now love is a little old <laughs> lady here. You know, like everyone had a part, as you said, to play in creating sustainable lives and, and in a positive way. So again, I can't thank you enough for what you do. Um, I, don't, I can't use a phrase that you use, but what you said was very accurate, split seconds, rapid decisions, engaging with people that you don't know. It's a challenging space and we don't always look at it from the global lens of where we all play a part. So thank you again.